played it tonight and then we'll do a um, little review of it in the morning and there's one other thing subject I'd like to um, do tomorrow morning but we'll try and complete it tonight is a, a, is a consideration of 2019 and what it could mean for us <coughs> So we're going to do with 2019 what we began to do with 2014 this morning. And that is bring in some prophetic periods. The first one I'd like to introduce is one that we did this morning, take two, 2014. And that is the 490. This 490 takes us back to 1529. 1529 was a different diet. We understood that what took us to 2014 was the diet of worms. This is the diet of spires. Two significant waymarks during the Reformation. The diet of spires in 1529 was the protest of the princes. This protest gave the reformers the name Protestant. That name first coined in 1529. There's a whole Ellen White chapter on the Diet of Spires. I just want to read for you a couple of paragraphs. She says, when in 1529, the German princes assembled at the Diet of Spires, there was presented the emperor's decree restricting religious liberty and prohibiting all further dissemination of the reformed doctrines. It seemed that the hope of the world was about to be crushed out. Would the princes accept the decree? Should the light of the gospel be shut out from the multitudes still in darkness? Mighty issues for the world were at stake. Those who had accepted the reformed faith met together and their unanimous decision was, let us reject this decree. In matters of conscience, the majority has no power. This protest whereby the princes stand up and say, we protest against your decree. Because in matters of conscience, the majority, in this case, the state and the church that have come together at this Diet of Spires has no power. Ellen White says, This principle we in our day are firmly to maintain. The banner of truth and religious liberty held aloft by the founders of the Gospel Church and by God's witnesses during the centuries that have passed since then has in this last conflict been committed to our hands. The responsibility for this great gift rests with those whom God has blessed with the knowledge of his word. So these founders of the gospel church, the founders of the gospel church found in the gospels and by God's witnesses during the centuries, uh, these Protestant reformers has been committed to whose hands? Our hands. Whose responsibility is it now to hold that banner aloft? <laughs> Ours. We can mark a decree, the holding aloft of a banner, also known as an ensign.
there will be a thus saith the church and a thus saith the state. Our ensign is to be lifted regardless of the wishes of either. Ellen White in six testimonies 402.3 says the banner of truth and religious liberty has been committed to us. I think that's a repeat. 403.1 Those reformers whose protest has given us the name of Protestant felt that God had called them to give the gospel to the world and in doing this they were ready to sacrifice their possessions, their liberty and their lives. Are we, in this last conflict of the great controversy, as faithful to our trust as were the early reformers to theirs? So why do they protest? Because they recognised that it was now their duty to give the gospel to the world. This was evangelism. She says, a thus saith the Lord is not to be set aside for a thus saith the church or a thus saith the state. The crown of Christ is to be lifted above the diadems of earthly potentates. So in 50, 1529, you have the Diet of Spires, where the name of Protestant is given as they protest a, dec a decree given by church and state. One other event in 1529 that we should also consider is the restraint of Islam. The Ottoman Empire began their attack on the West in 1529. Solomon the Magnificent tried to conquer Eastern Europe but he stopped at Vienna. He'd had a great deal of success, uh, virtually undefeated in his, his previous wars, previous battles. So he decides it's time to see if he can't take down Western Europe. And he begins that march in 1529, arriving at Vienna and unable to take the city, he proceeds no further. He's restrained. Ellen White says that before 1529, all those that were attempting to persecute God's people had been prevented. They had been prevented by the armies of the Turk, radical Islam, or the King of France, or the papacy himself. The King of France, the King of the South, radical Islam or the conditions of the papal church itself had prevented persecution coming against those uh, Protestant reformers. But in 1529, all of those things are dealt with and persecution begins. The next date I want us to consider is one we already uh, looked at this morning. 1799 this is a 220 when we already looked at what happened in 1799 we already marked that as taking us to our close of probation this was the end of the French Revolution and the setting up of a dictator, dictator Napoleon. This was the coup in which, regime, in which Bonaparte was about to bring down the regime of the directory that had been ruling France in 1795. <coughs> The reversal of military fortune in 1799 and 10 years of revolutionary upheaval prompted plotters to revise the constitution in a more authoritarian direction. In Napoleon, the plotters found their man as well as nearly continual warfare until 1815. Citizens, he announced, 
The revolution is established on the principles with which it began. It is over. Napoleon ends the French Revolution, but they already also begin to do one other thing. And that is they revise the Constitution in a much more authoritarian manner. This is attack, an attack on their, on their um, French Constitution to coincide with the setting up of a dictator. The next state we want to mark is the 151. That takes us to 1868. Depending on how interested you are in following world politics, American politics particularly, can be infuriating. But there is a call, a growing call to impeach Donald Trump. When you impeach a president, you begin the process of removing them from government. It is so difficult to remove a president from government in the United States that it has only been attempted a couple of times. The first time a president was impeached was in 1868. This was the impeachment of Andrew Johnson. Why are they calling for Donald Trump's impeachment? We spoke of two men that were standing in his way. One of those men, Robert Mueller. The other one, who was the other one? James Comey. Donald Trump had him fired when James Comey was investigating him uh, for his dealings with Russia. What was Andrew Johnson impeached for? Firing someone that Congress believed he should not have fired. On February 24 of 1868, something extraordinary happened in the US Congress. For the first time in history, the United States House of Representatives impeached a sitting president, Democrat Andrew Johnson. Now Johnson faced trial before the Senate. If convicted, he would be removed from the office of president. The politics behind this was that Andrew Johnson became president naturally without election after the death, assassination of Abraham Lincoln at the end of the American Civil War. Lincoln, of course, was of the North, but he had hired Andrew, John Andrew Johnson, brought Andrew Johnson into his government because Johnson was sympathetic to those Southern states and he believed that this would appease the Southern states. But when he died at the end of the American Civil War, Andrew Johnson became president. And now you have a president at the end of the American Civil War whose loyalties was with, was with the South during that Civil War. So he's already in conflict with the rest of the American government, particularly Congress. And one man that he was in conflict with was his Secretary of War, Edward Stanton. <coughs> Edward Stanton was not um, pushing Andrew Johnson's ideas as to the, um, how the United States was come together after the Civil War. And so Andrew Johnson had him fired despite the wishes of Congress. And for this, he was impeached. The only other impeachment in US history is that of Bill Clinton. So you have two impeachments in US history. Andrew Johnson and Bill Clinton. 
You have one other attempted impeachment that doesn't go ahead because he steps down before he can be impeached. That man who, who steps down was Richard Nixon. And why did these three presidents of the United States uh, face this opposition, either impeached or stepping down? Andrew Johnson? Firing someone he shouldn't have. <coughs> what about Bill Clinton? He undertook an affair. Also, significant allegations of sexual abuse. Those women were paid off. What was rich? Oh, one other thing. Lying. Under oath. He lied to try and get out of those allegations. What was Richard Nixon impeached for? Attempted to be impeached for? Election corruption. He had people loyal to him break into um, his enemies um, in buildings and wiretap them. A, a, sca a, a complicated scandal. So you have firing someone that shouldn't have been fired against the wishes of Congress, an affair, allegations of abuse, lying under oath, and corruption during a presidential election. All of these things are one, what un Donald Trump is being investigated for. Some of them, the affair and firing someone he shouldn't have, is proven. That's not debatable. These three are under investigation, but all five are the reasons that his impeachment is being so pushed uh, in the United States right now. <coughs> the next date I would like us to consider the 126. The 126 takes us to 1893. What happened in 1893? We're going to talk about the Chicago World Fair. A.T. Jones is going to tell us about the Chicago World Fair. A.T. Jones says, Notwithstanding the fact that in 1829 and 1830 the Congress of the United States adopted the Sunday Mail reports written by Richard Johnson in which it was declared that if the Sunday Act then demanded should be adopted it would be difficult for human sagacity to foresee how rapid would be the succession or how numerous the train of measures which would follow involving the dearest rights of all, the rights of con conscience. The 52nd Congress of the United States, in its legislation for this World Fair in Chicago in 19, 1893, took the dangerous step of interpreting the law of God, declaring in effect that the fourth commandment, the Sabbath commandment, was not only binding upon all men and nations, but that it required the observance of the first day of the week. This was a Sunday law in the United States. He goes on to say, he writes a whole article on this. I'm going to read a few excerpts, but it's a, a long passage that's worth reading. He's also included, mentioned, is a petition signed by 350,000 United States citizens protesting this, um, that this report is dedicated to. 
350,000 US citizens who'd written um, their names on a petition and he dedicates this to them. It's titled, The Captivity of the Republic. So if you're looking for A.T. Jones for this article, it's called The Captivity of the Republic. Note the dates mentions, he mentions in this next paragraph. He says that in February of 1863, there was begun an organised movement by a religious combination composed of the evangelical churches of the country to get the government of the United States committed by law to recognising the Christian religion and a national adoption and enforcement of a Sunday Sabbath. They proposed first to accomplish their purpose by amending the Constitution, declaring the United States to be a Christian nation and so placing all Christian laws, institutions under a legal basis, now making Christianity um, the law of the land. What, what year was that? 1863, his marking. Is that a way mark for God's people? The next year he marks. The next significant event during this adoption of laws that he marks. In 1888, Senator Blair introduced a bill to secure to the people the enjoyment of the first day of the week, commonly known as the Lord's Day, as a day of rest and to promote its observance as a day of religious worship. And the 25th of the same month, he introduced a joint resolution to amend the national constitution so as to establish the principles of the Christian religion as the religion of the nation. Immediately, there was a strong effort made all over the United States to secure the passage of the measures, especially a law that established and enforced the observance of a Sunday Sabbath. So the next state he marks... 1888. Is that a way mark? Yes. This is all written in 1893 because in 1893 it's present truth. He goes on to an explanation of how the Advent Adventist Church protested these moves in 1863 and 1888 and then he launches into a discussion of, about what they were trying to do in 1893. The three dates the Adventist Church is, for, is fighting the observance of Sunday. He says, the American Sentinel takes no part, the, the article uh, that he's writing in, takes no part in this Sunday opening campaign. What the debate in 1893 was, was over the Chicago World Fair whether the stalls in that World Fair, a huge event, were to be forced to shut on Sunday, whether they would make it um, illegal for those stores to open their shops on Sunday. He says, we do care and always have cared more than can be told whether the question should be decided by law and whether the government should thus be surrendered into the hands of a church power. Against this we have always protested and worked with all our might, both before and since it was done. In 1893, to protest, to fight, uh, to try and prevent this law coming into place in 1893, A.T. Jones went to Washington and spoke before the United States Congress. He was instructed by Congress that he could not base any of his reasons any of his reasoning to protest this law based on the United First Amendment of the United States Constitution, based on the separation of church and state, because they knew that what they were trying to do was in violation of the Constitution. A.T. Jones protests, it's, um, it's written out everything that was said before Congress. I'll just read a little. His objections were constitutional. He ignored their um, order to not speak about the US Constitution. Uh, A.T. Jones says there are other reasons, but the foundation of their argument is the fact it is unconstitutional. Th 
those who sent the petitions here, who worked for this Sunday law, knew that the Sunday law was unconstitutional even when they asked for it. What happened because of this conflict in the United States when the Protestant churches rose up and petitioned the Protestant churches rose up and petitioned the government to bring in a law enforcing Sunday observance at the Chicago World Fair. The Catholic Church had been waiting, according to A.T. Jones, waiting for centuries for this opportunity. Now when the Catholic Church sees Protestantism enforce Sunday, they use this as an excuse to remind Protestantism where they got Sunday in the first place. So the Catholic Church wrote in 1893 in four separate magazines a complete crushing takedown of Protestantism. The reason they're able to attack Protestantism so well is that when they see Protestantism push Sunday observance in four long articles where they go through the Old Testament and the New Testament, they prove, the Catholic Church proves that the only Sabbath recognized in the Word of God is a Seventh-day Sabbath. All of those Catholic articles are written up in our uh, search engines, in our pioneer writing search engines by A.T. Jones. The Catholic Church defended the Seventh-day Sabbath. A.T. Jones says, in stronger language than I could ever have done. The reason the Catholic Church does that is because they're calling Protestantism to recognize that their mother is Catholicism, that they've kept the Sunday, uh, Sunday Sabbath. And therefore... Have not, um, have not separated from their mother from Catholicism. The language used in those four magazine articles by the Catholic Church is um, very strong. It mocks Protestantism for recognizing no rule of faith and no teacher save thee in quotes infallible Bible and goes on to suggest if the only teacher that you really recognize is your infallible Bible, why are you worshipping on Sunday? Because the only place you'll find Sunday observance is through the Catholic Church. They say, this is still uh, the Catholic Church speaking, at the conclusion of their articles, it says, We have studiously and accurately collected from the New Testament every available proof that could be adduced in favour of a law cancelling the seventh day Sabbath and substituting another day. We have been careful to make the above dis distinction, lest it might be suggested that the third one commandment was abrogated under a new law so that the law was changed. <coughs> They say we've been able to prove that that never happened, that the Sabbath instituted in the beginning and confirmed in the beginning, they mean Eden, and confirmed again and again by Moses and the prophets, has never been abrogated, a part of the moral law, not a part or tittle of its sanctity has been taken away. The Bible and the Sabbath constitute the watchword of Protestantism, but we have demonstrated that it is the Bible against their Sunday Sabbath. This is the Catholic Church speaking. We have shown that no greater contradiction ever existed than their theory and practice of Sunday keeping. We have proved that neither their biblical ancestors nor themselves have ever kept one Sabbath day in their lives. The Israelites and Seventh-day Adventists are witnesses of their weekly desecration of the day named by God so repeatedly. And while they've ignored and condemned their teacher, the Bible, they have adopted a day kept by the Catholic Church. What Protestant can, after perusing these articles with a clear conscience, continue to disobey the command of God, enjoining Saturday to be kept, 
which command his teacher, the Bible, from Genesis to Revelation records as the will of God. The history of the world cannot present a more stupid, self stultifying specimen of dereliction of principle than this. The Catholic, this is still them speaking. The Catholic Church for over 1,000 years before the existence of a Protestant by virtue of her divine mission changed the day from Saturday to Sunday. We say by virtue of her divine mission because he who called himself the Lord of the Sabbath endowed her with his own power to teach. He that heareth you heareth me commanded all who believe in him to hear her under penalty of being placed with the heathen and publican and promised to be with her to the end of the world. She holds her charter as teacher from him, charter as infallible as as perpetual. The Protestant world at its birth found the Christian Sabbath too strongly entrenched to run counter to its existence. It was therefore placed under the necessity of acquiescing in the arrangement. It's too hard to change sad Sunday to Saturday. So they, they concede to keep the Sunday Sabbath. <coughs> Thus, this, uh, the, the Protestants at their very beginning implied that the Catholic Church had the right to change the day and have accepted that right for the last 300 years. The Christian Sabbath is therefore to this day the acknowledged child of the Catholic Church without a word of, of disagreement from the Protestant world. Their profession, they then quote from the Council of Trent, at the Council of Trent, the Catholic Church said that the proof, the proof that proved, showed that Protestantism did not place their faith in the Bible as their only teacher. The proof that they did not do that was the fact that they kept the Sunday Sabbath. They say the Protestants' claim of Scripture alone as the standard, the Bible and the Bible only, fails, and the doctrine of Scripture and tra tradition is then established. The Protestants themselves demonstrating that. It then calls on the Protestants to redeem themselves. And A.T. Jones calls on the Protestants of the United States to recognise their position. And he concludes with a statement, Dear reader, what will you do? So 1893, the Chicago World Fair, the captivity of the Republic, the third, um, I guess, crisis for the Adventist church when it comes to um, the state introducing Sunday legislation, the first in 1863, 1888, and now in 1893. We also see in this year an economic depression. That's claimed to be due to the rise of populism, nationalism. And the other thing that you can mark is the beginning of... If I have listed it here. The Religious Liberty Association. Because of these Sunday laws that were being introduced in 1893, the Adventist Church set up the Religious Liberty Association. Today it's the largest uh, association pushing for religious liberty in the world. It now addresses the United Nations, but it's no longer distinctly Adventist. Now it includes um, every religion. It's lost its distinction as an Adventist institution. So in 1893, you can mark this crisis where Protestants are really being called back to Rome due to their um, keeping of Sunday. The next date I want to mark is in 81. <coughs> Takes us to 1938.
All of these are our prophetic numbers that we've been using for some time. Sorry? Oh, yes. Our 81 takes us to 1938. This is known as the night of broken glass. Or crystal locked if you're German. This was when a turning point during the persecution of the Jews in 1938, it turned from being just repressive to being violent. This was the persecution of the Jews under the Nazis. <coughs> Nazis in Germany torched synagogues, vandalized Jewish homes, schools and businesses and killed close to 100 Jews. In the aftermath of the Night of Broken Glass, some 30,000 Jewish men were arrested and sent to Nazi concentration camps. German Jews had been repressed since 1933 when Adolf Hitler became the leader of Germany. <coughs> However, prior to this night, Nazi policies had been primarily non-violent. This was the turning point from non-violent to violent persecution. Also in 1938, the German authorities announced that residence permits for foreigners were being cancelled and would have to be renewed. So who is being attacked also in 1938? Who's having their citizenship questioned? This is immigration. Donald Trump has been pushing for this exact same step. He's been trying to cancel what is the, the United States form of a residence permit and force foreigners to renew. His attack on immigrants, a very neat parallel to that of Adolf Hitler. The next state that I want to mark is the 30 to 1989. This is the fall of the Berlin Wall, which is what verse in the Bible? Daniel 11 verse 40, the beginning of the fall of the Soviet Union. The Berlin Wall had been a symbolic marker of victory in the Cold War. The cover story of Time magazine said, at midnight, East Germans were free to leave at any point along the country's borders, including the crossing points through the wall in Berlin without special permission, for a few hours, a day, or forever. This occurred at midnight. It began at 11.30pm when Checkpoint Charlie, one of the major crossing points, began to open. Thousands of people pushed through. By midnight all the gates had opened and shortly after people started taking to the wall with whatever implements they could find. There's videos of the incident as they chip away with the, at the wall with whatever piece of metal or a piece of flint or rock they can find. The, the emotion that's built up in these people to see this symbolic marker of the Cold War go down, it marks their freedom. That was at midnight of uh, 1989. And the day was November 9. What day was the night of broken glass when this persecution changed from non-violent to violent? And the day that no Napoleon ended the French Revolution and began his dictatorship. November 9. <coughs> In 
If you're turning your Bibles to Numbers chapter 4, Numbers chapter 4, we find this same principle. In Numbers chapter 4, we could go to seven different verses, seven verses to prove this point. We'll just do the first one, Numbers 4 verse 3, if you would read that with me. From 30 years old and upward, even until 50 years old, all that enter into the host to do the work in the tabernacle of the congregation. When did a priest go to work? At 30 years old. Just to consider this 30, we understand that we are in the line of the priests. So if we consider November 9, 1989, the beginning of that 30 years, when does it end? November 9, 2019. 30 years from birth to when you go to work as a priest and whose life demonstrates that for us. This is the life of Christ. He was baptized at 30 years of age. Why? It was time for him to begin uh, his work as a priest. That's the reason that the Jewish leaders should have been able to calculate the year that they saw the Messiah because they should have known that he would have be been beginning his work at 30 years of age. You go back 30, they should have been able to calculate the year of his birth. They should then have recognized the signs of the times. Ellen White says, Jesus was our example in all things and he was an earnest and constant worker. He commenced his life of usefulness in childhood. At the age of 12, he was about his father's business. Between the ages of 12 and 30, before entering upon his public ministry, he led a life of active industry. So she divides Christ's life up into three periods of time. You have birth to the age of 12. And this is his development. But is he perfect in his development? Perfect. When is Christ 12? 2001. And then what begins here? His years of active industry. What was Christ's active industry in these years? He worked as a carpenter. And what is being built before 2001 and 2009? This is the construction of the temple. After 30 years, he begins his work as a priest, what Ellen White describes as public ministry. Why did the Protestants hold aloft their ensign? Because they knew that they had a work of public ministry. So from 1989 to 2001, we have the development from 2001 to 2009, as shown in the life of Christ, there is a work of construction. From 2019 forward, when Christ was baptized, it's to enter into public ministry. We traditionally see baptism in 2001. 9-11 equals baptism. So... When was Ellen, at what age was Ellen White bapti baptized? 
Early writings 11.2. At the age of 11 years I was converted and when 12 years old was baptised. This is baptism. When we went to Acts 27, we said there is nothing in inspiration that is wasted space. God knows that we have small minds, small amounts of time. We've had 6,000 years of degeneration and it's not going to waste space telling us stuff that isn't significant for our salvation. 12 equals baptism. She also says... It was at the age of 12 that Jesus met with the scribes and Pharisees and showed, showed their ignorance. She says throughout his childhood and youth, these years here, he manifested the perfection of character that marked his afterlife. He grew in wisdom and knowledge. So there's a growth there, a growth in wisdom and knowledge, but it comes along with perfection. Most of the people who have left the movement end up playing with these years in, in here, trying to say there was mistakes in this period of time, and that's what shakes their faith in this movement. And I would suggest that it was just as God would have had it, just as in the development of Christ. We're going to close and have a short 10-minute break and come back together. Uh, if you could, wouldn't mind rising and stretching your legs. <coughs> if you kneel with me in prayer, we'll close. Dear Father in heaven, thank you, Lord, for all of our blessings. I pray, Lord, that we will build as you would have us to build, that we might be prepared for our public ministry work, Lord that we might be able to be an ensign for the world, Father, and see the bringing in of, of um, your people, Lord, who you love, who are out there, Lord, and don't know of you. I pray, Lord, that you'll bless the remainder of these Sabbath hours. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.